Today is the last message in our series on his story. We've been looking at what the grand story of Scripture is and discovering that once we understand that, it helps us better understand all the other stories, and it helps us better understand our own life because we are actually part of his story. And as you might uh, suspect or imagine, uh, we will finish this series of the grand story in the book of Revelation, and we're in the next to the last chapter of the, of the Bible, and it's Revelation chapter 21, and this is what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those who are victorious will inherit all of this. I will be their God and they will be my children. If you remember, we opened up in the very first pages of the Bible and uh, to the phrase that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And now scripture is closing out by telling us that God is creating a new heavens and a new earth. When God created people to begin with, his intention was relationship. And he wanted them not only to enjoy his presence, but the paradise that he created for them. But the decision made by those first humans broke the relationship with God and broke down the created order. And ever since that moment, God has been working relentlessly to restore his creation and his relationship with humanity. So in the book of Revelation, we're seeing how this all works out. This is the spoiler alert. This is how everything is going to happen. And this isn't just a promise that's being made. John is actually getting a glimpse into the future. He's seeing what will happen. And what he sees not only restores his hope and inspires his worship, but he's reminded that the gospel prevails. The good news wins. And this passage actually reveals a lot about the heart of God. It's hard to find words to describe how good God is. So one of the things that John does is he identifies all the things that will be missing from God's order when it's restored in our world. He said there's no more dying, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. How many think that's already good news? If we could just eliminate that. But he doesn't stop there. But to find words for the positive things are hard. So he gives us little pictures of what God is like. And he said, he's like the faithful husband who's being married to his wife and, and how excited that husband is on his wedding day. That, that, that God is that excited about relationship with us. And then he says, he's like the parent that wipes away tears from a child's eyes. There's a kind of tenderness there. We don't expect that from God. We expect God to be the one saying, you better stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Is, does anybody have a parent that said that to you? Yeah. Any, any parent here said that to your kids? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do that. And, and God doesn't. He doesn't do that. He wipes away the tears. And there's one additional thing he does. He provides living water to those who are thirsty. He doesn't demean them for dying of thirst. He provides them what it is that they need. Now, why is it important for us to know how this all works out? Why do we need to know how the story ends? And this is the most important truth I want you to take from our time today. And that is the decisions you make today are determined by what you think will happen in the future. The decisions you make today are determined 
by what you think will happen in the future. And human beings are ridiculously consistent on this reality. If you think that there's no hope for the future, you will make a certain set of and kind of decisions. And if you think there is hope for the future, you make very different decisions. The decisions you make reveal a lot about what you think the future is going to hold. Now, this future that God talks about in Scripture is not a form of denial. Denial means that you're refusing to believe or accept that what go is going on around you is real. And God never asks us to pretend any of that. In fact, he invites us to approach him with all the challenges and all the difficulties that we have because we find that he can give resources to us to help us. This hope is not, does not deny the pain that we go through. Uh, there's nothing that is more annoying in our world than when you are hurting and somebody tells you it's not that bad. Um, have you ever been in the dentist chair when he blew air on a tooth? Have you ever done that? Yeah? And, and I, I've told my dentist, that hurts. And I would appreciate it if you don't do that again. And then they do. Because he's not sure exactly which tooth. And uh, I think they shouldn't blow air <laughs> on my teeth. I don't like that. This hope does not deny the pain that you're in. It doesn't say if you could just see something differently, the pain would go away. That's not what this hope is about. This hope simply refuses to accept the lie that what you see right now is all there is. That pain will not be the last thing you will ever know. And darkness will not snuff out the light. There is more to life than you can see. There is more to God than you can see. And there is more than you than you can see. And that's what this hope tells us. You are not the end, at the end of the book of your life. You may be at the end of a chapter, but just keep turning the pages because it does get better as you go. If you want to understand the grand story of God, you need to understand the commitments, the long-term commitments that God makes to us. And over and over and over again, he does this. So let's look at what commitments are revealed in this passage. And the first commitment is that God is committed to make new or renew everything. God is committed to make new or renew everything. God is intimately aware of the suffering that we are going through. And what's really strange is that in our world, he's often blamed for the suffering that occurs, when in fact a lot of the suffering in our world has nothing to do with God and has everything to do with the side effects of human decisions. Please don't misunderstand me to think that I'm telling you that if you are going through a painful reality, that it is your own decision. That can be true, but someone else can make a decision about you and bring pain into your life. It's astonishing how often God gets blamed for that. And God also gets blamed for the random realities of a broken and a dark world. You see, God created a masterpiece in creation, but that masterpiece has been marred and it has been broken. And the things we see are not what he intended. And he has been relentlessly committed to renewing and making new everything. Now, God has invested wisdom and knowledge into our world. But there's a couple of reasons why people tend to reject that wisdom and knowledge. For example, if you just want to be responsible to make your own rules, just make up your own rules then you don't want a God who's going to invest that wisdom and knowledge into you because you want that freedom and liberty. Here's the challenge with making up your own rule model, and that is that if you have that right, then so does everybody else, and if they have that right, they could very easily do things that are destructive to you. And so we wind up in a very confusing world because people argue there's not a standard of what is right and wrong. And the Bible says that there is, and God wants us to have that so that we don't keep imposing pain on each other. But there's another reason that people tend to reject the wisdom and the knowledge of God, and that's because of how it is communicated. Often people try to communicate the wisdom of knowledge of God in angry ways. Now, how many here would be surprised this morning to discover that there are some people who will teach and preach God's word in angry ways? I know you're stunned, but it has happened. 
and uh, here's what you should know about that. How can it be good news? That's what the word gospel means, good news, if God is angry about it. I mean, who's angry about good news? And here's what I want you to know. God is not nearly as angry as some people who claim that he is. In fact, there's this great story in Numbers chapter 20. You have to know the story that precedes it before this one in order to get the benefit from it. At one point, the whole nation of Israel, while they're journeying out of Egypt and towards the promised land, they run out of a drinking water supply. And so Moses goes to God, and he doesn't know what to do, and God tells him to take his staff and strike the rock, and that water would flow out, and it would be such sufficient supply that everyone who is part of that group will have all the water they need and for their animals. And so Moses goes out in front of everybody, and he strikes the rock, and water just flows out of the rock. That's cool. Well, later on in their journey, and they've been in this journey for quite a while, they run into another situation where there's no water. And once again, Moses goes to God. You can find this story in Numbers chapter 20. And God tells Moses, I want you to take your staff and go stand in front of the rock, and I want you to speak to the rock. And just tell the rock to flow water out so that all the needs of all the nation are met. And Moses is not having a good day. How many here have ever had a day like Moses? And he walks out there with a stick, and he doesn't say anything that God told him. This is what he said. You rebels! God didn't say that. Do I have to bring water out of a rock for you? And then he strikes the rock with his staff. And nothing happens. So being a typical man, he strikes it again. <laughs> because if it doesn't work the first time, try it again. And this time the water flows. But listen to this. That instant, he was no longer permitted to go into the promised land. I want you to hear this. I think this is astonishing. This was a man who was guilty of incredible crimes in his life. And that didn't keep him out of the promised land. But presenting God as angry when he was not did keep him out. We need to be really careful about acting like God is angry when, in fact, God's not, but we are. Aren't you glad God doesn't have as many bad days as you do? I am. Second, long-term commitment. God is committed to remove everything that separates us from one another. God is committed to remove everything everything that separates us from one another. So this is how he says it. He says there, there, there's a new heavens and a new earth and there's no longer any sea. Now when I read that, I, I got a little anxious because I thought, wait a minute, I like the beach. I like the seashore, so in the new heavens and new earth. But that's not what it means. You see, John is one of Jesus' original disciples and he's the author of the Gospel of John. And Christianity at that time was under intense persecution. And John has actually been arrested, and he's been sent to an island that is not like the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is a nasty place called Patmos. Nobody would ever want to live there. It was small. It was rocky. It was barren. It was more like Alcatraz than any of the uh, beautiful islands in the Caribbean. And it's where the criminals of Rome were sent. And there were mines on Patmos. And that was the forced labor. You were forced to work in the mines. This is, this is what, the light, what life was like for John at this point. And this is what he wants us to know. He is separated from everyone he knows and everything he loves and everyone he loves by the sea. He's on this island and he can't see anybody. He can't eat with his friends. He can't worship in his church. He can't do anything because it's the sea that separates him from everything and everyone he loves. And that's why it is so important for him to hear the words, there is coming a day where there's a new heaven and a new earth and there will no longer be anything that separates you from the things and the people that you love. He can't be with them. So how, how many things separate us from the people that we love? And not the least of which is death. God is committed long term to removing everything that separates us from one another. And one day there will be nothing that separates us from his love and from those that we love. It brings us to the third long term commitment of God. God is committed to do all of this based on grace. 
God is committed to doing all of this based on grace. It's a really interesting picture. He says there's a new city coming down from heaven. See, the world doesn't have to work its way up to heaven. We don't have to become enlightened and sufficiently righteous so that we actually can break the plane into heaven. In fact, as much as we strive for enlightenment and as much as we strive for the kinds of rules that make our planet better, we seem to be unbelievably earthbound creatures. With all of our technology and all of our scientific advancement, we seem to not be making a lot of progress. Prejudice has not disappeared in our world. Crime is consistent and violent. And if we are waiting for the world to emerge enlightened, enlightened and moral, well, we're going to have to wait a very long time. Sometimes people say, yeah, you Christians have been waiting for 2,000 years for Jesus to return. What are you going to give up? And what I want to say back is, well, you've been waiting for the world to get its act together for how many thousand years, and we're no closer. I, th I think Jesus will come back before the world figures it out. I'm hoping in that. So God brings his city to us. We don't have to build it. Isn't that great? We can't build a city like that, but God brings it to us. And the water of life is given freely to anyone who is thirsty with no cost to them. When a person is dying for thirst, if you're even a little bit thirsty, it is easy to take advantage of them. If you've traveled by airplane any time recently, one of the things you'll discover is when you go through security, they take away any water bottles that you have. The water bottle that I filled at home, they take that away. And then as soon as I get past security, if I want another water bottle, it costs a lot of money. I was in the airport recently, and I bought a water bottle, and I put it up on the counter, and the woman said, that'll be $3.50. Is that okay with you? I said, no, it's not okay with me, but what choice do I have? Are you going to offer me a discount on this bottle of water? She said, I am not. I said, well, then here's your three fifty. dollars She had me over a barrel, and she knew it, right? This is what our world does. When you are thirsty and the resource is limited, then they leverage the opportunity to take advantage of you. That's how our world works, but that is never how God works. If you are thirsty, he freely gives of the water of life because he is that generous. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. God is just that generous. And while it doesn't cost you anything, it cost him dearly. He gave his only son, who gave his only life. In fact, there's this point when he's on the cross where he cries out because he is thirsty. And Jesus dies with thirst so that we can drink freely of the water of life forever. That's what Jesus does for us. This is why it is so important. The decisions you make today are determined by what you think will happen in the future. Now, some people will say, well, you know, we'll have to wait and see who's right, whether this actually all turns out this way or not. And uh, so we can't really know until this is all over. And what I want you to know is there is a way to know now. There is. Uh, the question is, the truth that you're believing in, does it help you to live a better life or not? Does it help you better endure challenges and difficulties or not? Does it help you make our world a little bit better or a little bit worse? I'm astonished in our world that we have such respect for systems of thought that drive us to self-medication and inspire quitting and stand by while entropy and apathy dominate our culture. And people actually, once, they're in, they're, uh, uh, con once they've been made contagious by this disease, there's this, this sickness that enters into them and they actually feel a little bit superior because they think there's no meaning in life. Nothing is ever going to work out. Nothing we do will ever matter. And they feel a little bit intellectually superior. They insist that there's no hope for the future. Nothing we do matters. There's no meaning. And here's what I want you to, once you believe that, you're going to have to medicate yourself for the anxiety and for the despair that you are going to feel. And this is what I want you to know. Anything, any system of thought that steals life away from you now is not the answer and it's not the solution. 
People who buy into that way of life are just buying in to the constant degradation of everything that we see and know. But those who have placed their faith in Christ and trust God's commitment to make all things new again, you would be astonished at how incredibly resilient those individuals are. I wish I could tell you that if you become a follower of God, that you will never get sick, that you will never get old, that you will never know pain, that no one you know will ever be hurt, that you will never be in an emergency room or an intensive care room, and you will never stand by a recently filled grave. I wish I could tell you that, and none of those things are true. If you are a Christian, you will have to live in the real world just like everybody else. But the good news is you don't have to live alone in the real world. And here's what's fascinating. When you know there's a greater hope, you better handle what you're going through right now. That's what happens. He is a present help in time of our trouble. We don't interpret the pain that we experience in life as punishment from God. We actually see him as an ally who comes along beside of us to assist. One of the most devastating things a person can ever come to the conclusion of is that nothing is going to change. The moment you cross that bridge, it is astonishing how it affects your decision making. Your resolve begins to dissolve. Your strength begins to fail. And your heart shuts down. And your capacity to care for others is lost because nothing is ever going to change. But that's not what God says. Everything is going to be made new or renewed. Maybe you've heard of her. Her name is Johnny Erickson Tata. And when she was a very young lady, she jumped off of a diving board and she broke her neck and damaged her spinal cord. And as a result, she's been paralyzed from her shoulders down ever since. Life has not been easy for her. But listen to what this woman who does have the hope of Revelation 21 as part of her foundation for life. Listen to what she says. I can still hardly believe that I, with atrophied muscles, shriveled, bent fingers, and no feeling from the shoulders down will one day have a new dazzling body that's in wonderful working order and clothed in righteousness. Not to mention, I will also have a mind that doesn't want to resign or quit. You may not be paralyzed with a broken neck, but you could be paralyzed by other limitations, a broken heart, a broken home, a broken reputation. The temporal troubles we face may slam the door to sustained satisfaction in this life, but then again, they can throw open windows wide into the vibrant hope of heaven. How is she able to endure day by day? Because she knows a better day is coming. One day, you are going to hug those that you love and have been separated from by the grave. And one day, you will dance and run with bodies that are strong and healthy again. And one day, you will sing with voices strong the incredible things of God. And one day, you will tell your own stories with all the chapters of failure and struggle and suffering and see all the more clearly the grace of God at work in all of them. And one day, we will sit around a table and meet, eat the most amazing food with those that we so dearly miss right now. And how do I know this is true? How can I say with any confidence this is true? And that is because the very first fracture in the old world order happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. And he came back with a renewed and a very new resurrected body. And he could hug his disciples and he could eat with his disciples and their relationship and their fellowship was fully restored. And what he accomplished that moment in that time is one day going to be for all moments and all time. That is how his story ends. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, maybe you're in a pretty good season in life right now. And if you are, I am thrilled for you. And I hope it's a long and enjoyable run. Maybe you're here this morning and it's been a rough time for a while. 
Maybe there's a regimen of medication that the doctor requires you to be on that frustrates you and the side effects limits you. Uh, maybe you're having to go through therapy for something that doesn't seem to be improving or getting better. Maybe relationships are strained and look like they're about to fracture. Maybe finances are tight. And what I want you to know is that none of that is evidence that God doesn't love you. God doesn't wait for us to get our act together for him to love us. And he's not embarrassed by us when we're struggling. He walks into the room we're in. And he promises us. Please hear his words. I promise you, I am making everything new. Everything that hurts, everything that's hard about what you're going through right now, someday it will no longer be true. So just trust me. And the same God who is committed to spending all eternity with us wants to walk through this day with you. So Father, help us today. Help us trust that whatever it is we have to face, we don't have to fear it because you are with us. And one day, all of this will be different. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning.